Let's talk about how to protect your moneymaker. You're a voice actor. You're an entrepreneur. You're a VOpreneur. Welcome to the Everyday VOpreneur Podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. Having your voiceover demos easily playable and downloadable on your website is essential. The Voice Sam Player lets you do that across any device and browser. There are also options for adding play buttons in your email signature, tracking your listens, and even putting videos in your demo player. Sign up now at voicesam.com slash markscott and receive an instant $25 credit. For full details and to claim this offer, visit voicesam.com slash markscott. The VOpreneur Podcast. Hey, it doesn't suck. Not as funny as Conan. Not as cute as Seth Meyers. Not as smart as Colbert. But he's one of us, and that counts for something. Here's Mark Scott, the original Everyday VOpreneur. Hello and welcome to the Everyday VOpreneur Podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. I'm Mark Scott, the original Everyday VOpreneur. And as always, ready to give you another episode filled with actionable, practical advice that you can use to grow your voiceover business. We're doing things just a little bit differently today. Now, before I get into that, I'd like to ask one favor. If you're enjoying the podcast, and I hope that you are, I hope you're learning from it, would you do me a favor and leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts? I would love to read it. I'd love to be encouraged by it. And I'd love to be able to share it with others to help them discover the podcast as well. So if you could leave that five-star review on Apple Podcasts, I would be grateful. Now, I know generally this podcast is all about the business and marketing side of voiceover. And so maybe this episode's going to feel a little bit off. But I also know that there is no business in marketing if you don't have a voice to market with. And so for that reason, I felt like this was a really appropriate topic. Vocal care is one of those things that we don't often think about, but we all should. Probably a lot more than we do. And so I think from this episode, you are going to learn a ton, and I'm pretty sure it's going to get you thinking about a subject that you don't think about enough. Our moneymaker is something most of us don't actually understand how it works or, or how to take care of it. Do you really know how your voice works? Do you really understand how to take care of it or why certain practices are so important to the success and the longevity of your career? My guest today is not only a talented and well-credited voice actor, but she also coaches voice actors, as well as comedians, teachers, podcasters, and business people on how to better use and care for their voices. Welcome to the show, Nick Redman. Welcome. That was a great intro. Very dramatic. I like to build it up, you know, get people yeah. really excited. So, <laughs> you know, I'm really looking forward to this because I will be completely honest with you. It is a topic that I know nothing about. And so, you know, when I say at the beginning here, do you really actually understand how your voice works or how to take care of it? I put my hand up and I'm like, no, no, I don't have a That's clue. Okay. So I'm counting <laughs> on getting a really solid education by the time we get to the end of this. But let's start sure. with you're a voice coach, which is different mm -hmm. from a voice over coach. Obviously, performance is key. And I'm, I'm guessing that that's a little bit of what you do, particularly when you're working with teachers, podcasters, things of that nature. But I guess the, the question is, before we can deliver a great performance, we need to be comfortable with our voice as an instrument. So help us understand what you specifically do as a voice coach. Sure. So the main difference, if we were to literally compare it from, from the term voice coach to voice over coach, is that I am an expert specialist in the workings of the human voice as an instrument. So what I bring to sessions with voiceovers is the ability to listen to their technique and their breathing and their articulation and look at them on Zoom a lot of the time these days and just see if there's any tensions or any particular habitual patterns in their literal voice use as in the instrument that might be holding them back or getting in the way of their reads. A lot of people come to me, if we're thinking from the voiceover sphere, they come to me saying things like, I just feel like I'm a bit vocally fatigued or tired. You know, I have to, particularly audiobook narrators, you know, I can't record for as long as I used to be able to, or I keep tripping up over this particular combination of words, or I can't get to the end of a sentence without having to take loads of breaths, or this producer said my breaths are too noisy, or I keep saying um or something and I help to reduce it all and I help them understand 
how their voice works as much as they need to. I mean, you don't need to know all of the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the larynx. That's my job. What you guys need to know is the stuff that's related to the day to day. So breath, articulation, vocal quality, tonal quality, range, resonance, uh, all that kind of stuff and general vocal health as well. So uh, when you see people posting in forums saying things like, ah, I've got a cold, what do I do? And people post lots of different kind of remedies. You'll see me tearing in most of the time going, yes, but if you that probably won't do much. You probably need to think about this exercise and this exercise and this exercise. And, and don't put menthol in your steam, actually, because it'll dry out the vocal folds. And that's not what we want. And maybe try a nebulizer instead. And this is the most up to date research on this. And please don't believe your granny's granny's granny that if you drink garlic standing on one foot, it'll bring your voice back. <laughs> So that's what I do. This brings me, this totally brings me back to, so when I used to work in radio and I would get a cold, but I'd still have to come in and do my show because my boss Mm -hmm. always made me. And I remember talking about it on the air one day and taking calls from people like, you know, literally, what is your grandma's home remedy for (laughs) for this or whatever, right? And I remember this, I had a few people that called in and talked about putting Vicks VapoRub on your feet and then putting your socks on and then going to sleep like that. And I'm thinking, like, this is literally the stupidest thing ever. And they're like, no, it's like the the vapors go up through your feet and through your bloodstream. And I'm like, okay, this is absolutely stupid. But at the same time, I was also entirely desperate. And so I was like, what do I got to lose by trying this, right? And then the next day, I remember going on the air thinking, like, you guys are totally screwing with me, weren't you? Like, nobody actually does this. <laughs> and everybody knows this doesn't actually work. You just wanted to see whether or not uh, I would do it. But But this is an interesting point that you bring up because as we are recording... I'm trying to get over a a head cold or possibly it was COVID. I was down for about a week and a half. I had Mm. major congestion and, uh, and, you know, testing is something that we don't have a lot of access here uh, to here right now. So we're we're told to assume that it is COVID, but it's definitely impacted my voice. Mm. I know rest. Some people say medication, more rest fluids until you float. So (laughs) what kind of tips do you have for the voice actor? Well, whether it's COVID or just cold and flu season in general, because that's something that we deal with every year. And it Mm. is a pain in the butt when you rely on your voice for your living. Yeah, it really is. And particularly allergies, because to be honest, everybody reacts differently to allergies. And I think that's the first thing you've got to think about with vocal health is your body is your body and it will respond differently to whatever remedy you put in it to somebody else. So that's why I sometimes caution people, at least my clients who come to me or have access to me via my Facebook group or what have you, that it's actually sometimes quite dangerous to just randomly take advice on medication and things from someone on the internet because they have no idea of your medical history and your requirements as a human. So the first thing to remember is your voice and your body are completely different to other people and they will respond in different ways. When it comes to colds and flus and that kind of thing, and and yeah, maybe COVID, you've got to think about how it's affecting you as well. What are the symptoms that you've got? So if you've got a bunged up nose, but your voice is okay, then you're going to want a different approach to your voice and your sin- your your sinuses are clear, but your voice is husky. That's a completely different thing. So when someone posts a question like, my voice is really hoarse, what do I do? I've got a session later. Often you see, drink this tea, have this throat syrup, all that kind of stuff. But the truth of it is, none of that actually goes anywhere near your vocal folds. So it's actually, actually not going to help at a topical level and do anything for the hoarseness that you're feeling. So you've got to think about something that's going to help literally at vocal fold level or laryngeal level in a different way. Now, if you're hoarse, that's down to some kind of vocal fatigue or down to some kind of uh, illness in the larynx, like laryngitis or something that really affects the vocal folds. And if that's the case, if you can get your hands on a nebulizer with some 0.9% saline solution, uh, that's a really good way of rehydrating the vocal folds from the outside in. Steaming is lovely and it's very soothing for the pharynx and the the heat that you get in the steam is thought to sort of kill or stem off any germs that may be building up in what's called the pharynx, the pharyngeal area, which is basically the throat from just above the larynx to the uh, nasal cavity. So if there's any germs building up there, steam can help. But it's now sort of thought that steaming doesn't actually hydrate the vocal folds as much as they thought it did. It'll go down, it'll land on the vocal folds, maybe, and then it'll just evaporate off. So a nebulizer is really good if you want to rehydrate and help that huskiness really quickly for a session. I would 
encourage all voice actors to have a nebulizer in their kind of emergency vocal health toolkit. I've got mine. I've got two actually right in my eye line, <laughs> just ready to go in case I need them. So that's like a quick fix, which is really good. But just remember that you can drink as much fluid as you want, and that's great generally. But it will take about, well, I mean, the research on this is different, but some people say between four and eight hours before the fluids actually hydrate you systemically through your body and then get to the vocal folds and do anything to the mucus on there. Because ultimately what we want is lovely slippery mucus. Sorry if you're having your uh, breakfast <laughs> while you're listening to this. Mmm, slippery mucus drink. Sounds delicious. Uh, gorgeous. I'll have some. Uh, but if... Some people actually say by the time your body uses the water you take in, hardly any of it gets to your vocal folds anyway. So it's just better to keep as hydrated as possible all the time if you can. And if you're congested, that's the best way as well. Just really keeping those that hydration up. If you need to get rid of the sort of sinus congestion really quickly, again, the nebulizers are great and they often come with like a little kind of sort of mask attachment that you can put over your nose and your mouth. And if you're blocked in the sinuses, that's a really nice way of clearing the mucus. Also... I love a bit of um, sort of facial lymphatic drainage massage. That really helps me with my sinuses. You can see that on the internet if you Google it on the old YouTube. It's just sort of gently encouraging the drainage that's been blocked for because of the illness or the virus that's sort of taking hold on your system and it encourages it all to kind of get moving again and that can really help your sinuses and to clear that out. So there's different remedies for different things but I do just always caution and I... I, I did a bit of research recently on it. Somebody had posted in one of the forums somewhere that they had, they were suffering from vocal fatigue and there were lots of, you know, things in there about certain things, coating the vocal folds and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it's just nonsense because nothing that you eat, drink, suck or swallow goes anywhere near the vocal folds because it's a different tube. And if it did, you would die. <laughs> so or choke. <laughs> the, the part I think that, that's really blowing my mind here is what you're saying is that people on social media aren't all doctors. No, did you? No, or politicians or scientists. I don't know how I feel about this. I think you're I just know. I think you're just blowing up the whole, you know, perceived <laughs> reality of of the internet right now, but here it's so true, right? Yeah. I mean, any time from I don't know, October to April, you know, cold and flu season, which I mean, I know it varies everywhere, but any day you can sign into any Facebook forum and related to voiceover and see somebody post about, I've got a cold, what do I do? And there's a yeah. thousand remedies that are there. And I'm, I'm guessing, so like, look, when I'm sick, I need wonton soup and I need hamburger helper with boxed mashed potatoes. It's the only right. time in my life that I eat boxed mashed potatoes. These mm. are the two things that I need. If I'm sick, you bring me wonton soup. You bring me hamburger helper with boxed mashed potatoes, and I am convinced <laughs> that this is what is going to heal me. Great. So there's an element of this that is also very much psychological, right? Oh, my gosh, yeah. Like, the whole entire relationship with your voice is completely psychosomatic. It's body, mind, voice. I talk about that all of the time. And the truth of it is, so much of this advice is well-meaning, and so much of it comes from a place of experience and, and love and something that people perceive genuinely helps them. And that is... On the one hand, part of the battle, you know, if you believe it to work, i.e. placebo effect, then it's reducing the anxiety and the stress that you're having because of the symptom that you're feeling. And you will probably start to feel better because your body will stop fighting and trying to, like, stop you being stressed and keep you alive. And it'll come out of fight or flight mode and it'll go, oh, actually, now that I'm out of fight or flight, I can see that I need to fix those vocal folds. Or I can see that I need to sort those sinuses out and it gets to work on the actual problem. So there is absolutely a psychological thing to yeah. it. So listen, have your wonton suit in your box of mashed potatoes. That sounds absolutely great. I mean, I'm <laughs> Irish. I'll have mashed potatoes in any any form. And they definitely, definitely are medicine in Ireland. <laughs> so so I would go for it. Um, I think it's just some of the ina inaccuracies. Um, I, I get geekily and sort of very pickily concerned about because, you know, I just want everyone's voices to be right. And look, you can drinking tea is great because it's hydration, so it will help towards fluids. But taking a you know pan can cow cow whatever it's called tea uh, like throat syrup. I don't know. It's some There's kind of so Chinese many... remedy. Yeah, yeah. Of like throat syrups. They make you feel lovely and they might coat your throat gorgeous, but it's not going to do anything at vocal fold level because it will not touch them. So I think that's just one of the things 
that I like to keep reminding people of. But um, some people like that in forums and some people don't. Some people think I'm on my high horse and uh, know everything better than other people. <laughs> Which it, in some in that world I sort of do in a way, but I'm not doing it like a <laughs> like a pain in the arse way. I just want everyone to have nice voices, Mark. <laughs> I, I think that I have gotten to a point in my age now where I'm just like, you know what, I'm just going to go to bed. And when I feel better, I'll get up and go back to work. And and if (laughs) if that's like, if that's two days, great. If that's a week, well, crap, but whatever. And because otherwise I could easily go out and spend, you know, a hundred dollars on NyQuil and DayQuil and pump myself full of vitamin C and eat my wonton soup and all this sort of stuff. But I'm still not getting any better, any faster. It's right. Like at the end of the day, sometimes I think I just need to listen to my body and, and, and get my rest. But you're right too, that you know, everybody's well-meaning and certain things do work different for different people, as you said yep. from the very beginning. But there are some things that are obviously uh, proven to be a little bit more effective for sure. Yep. Now, one of the things that you said early, and I want to circle back to this because I thought it was interesting. You talked about when you're working with people, you're you're watching them on mm-hmm. Zoom. And Not so, in a weird way. Not in a weird way. Right. But, <laughs> uh, but there's obviously there's body language. I guess, Mm -hmm. ultimately corresponds with our spoken language. So just expand on that a little bit more. What are things that you, what are some of the common things that you see people do that either make them sound more tense or help them to loosen up? Or how how does that work when we're, when we're in the booth as voice actors? Yeah. So as a voice practitioner, part of my training is diagnostics. So nothing that needs clinical intervention and, you know, putting, pipes down noses and all that kind of thing. That's clinical pathology. And if I feel someone needs that, then I refer upwards to my heady team of experts who I have access to if it's something out of my remit. But what I watch for in spoken voice users, particularly people on microphones, like voiceover artists, narrators, podcasts, of course. I don't know if you know, but podcasts are really hot right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard. So I'm working. Yeah, you should do one. (laughs) So I work with a lot of podcasters. And some of the physical things that I see there are to do with posture and alignment. So when we're quite focused on speaking into a microphone, there's a bit of a tendency for a cheeky little chin jut. So the chin kind of comes out and everything gets quite, I'll demonstrate now and you can hear how it kind of changes the tone of my voice. So if I stick my chin forward and don't change anything else, all of a sudden my voice sounds a bit restricted. Now I can push to sound like I usually sound through that posture, but it's a lot more effort and I'm going to feel it a lot more quickly. So what I tend to do with people, what I'm seeing and what I'm sort of Sherlock Holmes scanning them for is alignment issues, is things like breath being really high in the chest, tense shoulders, uh, tense neck, Things like jaw tension as well is pretty easy to see from the outside as well as lip tension. Uh, Just general tension really and holding because tension is sort of the enemy of a free and responsive, efficient vocal instrument. So if I can give them a few solutions for the chin jutting and the sort of jaw tension and the tongue tension and all that kind of stuff, you know, they're uh, they're home in a boat in terms of fixing things like vocal fatigue. So I'm at the end of illness myself, so I'm not the best advert for It's like the best voice. time for us to be recording this. You're getting over it. I'm getting over it. We're oh, sitting God. here talking about vocal health. Send it's me some of that mashed potato, please. So this is interesting because uh, there are times when I'm going into the booth, if I know that I'm supposed to do a read that's like more laid back, relaxed, conversational, right? Which long career in broadcast, conversational is the bane of my existence. I'm, I'm <laughs> an announcer at heart, right? I will mm-hmm. actually go into my booth and set up in such a way that I can almost kind of lean back in my chair with my feet up, mm. which seems really stupid. But at the same time, when I'm in that kind of a position, I don't know if it's like a psychological thing or whatever, but it helps me just to kind of chill out. And and maybe it does release some of that tension that you're talking about to be able to deliver a different type of performance. So it's interesting to hear you talk about stuff like this because... I mean, maybe it maybe it means I'm a little less crazy or maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But it's, no. it's things like that that I do sometimes. I, I have gotten more cognizant of how I hold my shoulders and my hands and, you know, all that sort of stuff, because I see how there's a correlation there. Well, it's voice body connection, right? And uh, yeah, absolutely. If you put yourself in a more conversational repose where you feel more relaxed, then you're absolutely going to sound more conversational. It's perfect. When I work with voiceovers, which I do also on copy and voiceover performance, um, a lot of which is informed by my 
experience working on text and rhetoric and things in a drama school setting, because so much of that can be applied over, it's brilliant, is getting them to embody in some way the feeling of the text. So people laugh or they think I'm an absolute head the ball, as we say in Ireland, i.e. eejit or silly person. How many different definitions do I need to give? I just keep giving dialect <laughs> definitions, don't have the same thing. <laughs> oh dear. It'll be a what's the crack next. So I keep, I basically, if you know, if it's an upbeat read and it's about a nightclub, I'll get them to have a boogie or whatever it is, you know, because yep. that voice body connection, voice informs the delivery. Um, so you're, you're doing the right thing, mate. You're absolutely doing the right thing. Get your feet up, getting that lazy boy. Look at that. I'm a secret genius. I didn't even know it. But it, it, you followed your instincts. That's it, right? I mean, I, I at this point, there comes a point where, for me, trying to overcome the announcer thing, right? I'm like, I'm desperate. I'll do anything that I can think of. And so if it means sitting in the booth kind of laid back with my feet up, like if that makes the difference, then <laughs> perfect. Let's do it. Bring so it on. confession time. When it comes to vocal warm-ups, I admit that I am literally the worst voice actor on the history of the, the planet like I bet you're not I, I bet literally I've met worse <laughs> I roll out of bed in the morning I I fill my little yeti cup with water and I go I just walk straight down into the studio and just start recording like literally that's it that's my my warm up yeah. is the 3 minutes that it takes me to walk from the bed to fill up my water down into the studio to start recording <laughs> I'm guessing this is probably bad so why is it bad and and what should I be doing instead Well Firstly, let's just reframe this. Has not warming up stopped you from doing your job? It's never really stopped me, no, but I suppose I'm thinking there's probably things that if I did things differently, you know, yeah. maybe I'd last longer during the day or maybe my voice wouldn't wear out so quick or, you know, maybe there I got to go. be thinking about long-term vocal health too, right? Because so often we live in the moment in the session, but what about five years down the road when you've, exactly. used, you know, you've abused your voice for so long or whatever, right? Yeah, you're absolutely answering it, it that question in you know the perfect way because if you can do your job without warming up, that's great. That's not a problem. You're probably not going to feel like you want to do a warm up, and that's totally fine. But I always always say, I always say to people, but what if? Firstly, what if you warmed up? What if you spent literally five minutes, which is all it needs to take, five to ten minutes for a warm up, releasing the articulators, getting the breath going, maybe getting the body going. Maybe you'll reduce the amount of takes that you have to do. Maybe you'll have to edit less. Maybe you'll do more one take wonders kind oh, of situation. I would yeah? so love to edit less. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> save yourself time, save yourself money. Yep. So it's about prep. And then, of course, you said long-term vocal health. Absolutely. I can tell you now, I have worked with voiceovers as a coach who come to me going, I spent 20 years not warming up, not needing to warm up. And now, all of a sudden, as I get older, because news flash voices age too. Yep. My voice isn't lasting as long. I My breath is going. I don't know what to do. I can't last as long as I was. Please, can you help me? And your voice is the same as the rest of your body. If you suddenly decide you want to run marathons at 70, it's probably going to take you a bit longer to get to the stage where you can do it than if you started when you're a wee bit younger. So if you can do a few things and get your body used to having some slightly different habitual patterns and holdings and and if you can release some tension and make your voicing easier now, then you're just future-proofing yourself, really. So I think some people feel like warming up has to be this huge, massive kind of dramatic thing, you know, and it really doesn't doesn't have to take a lot. And what I work a lot on people with is giving them the autonomy and the kind of understanding to know what to do with their voice day to day in the moment. So one day you may know you've got two things to do and you don't need to warm up. Fine, get on with it. Then, you know, next day after maybe bank holiday weekend, you suddenly realize you've got like three days of narration to do. You might think, you know what, I should probably do something with my voice. Feels a little bit tired, push myself at the weekend a little bit socially because that's voice use too and yep. that can be tiring. Um, why don't I do a five or 15 minute warm up before, you know, in the morning and then when I come back after lunch and just see if that helps me get through. And what I help people do is give them all the tools they need to carve the warm-up they need each day in the moment and change it if they need it, you know, so they don't get bored. And so they're definitely doing things that are really working for them. Because also, there's it's just as useless to be doing a warm-up that you've been doing for 25 years that someone told you in drama school a thousand years ago was good for your voice. Because things we know about voice changes all the time because the information and the research gets better and more rigorous. 
So if you're still doing a warm up you were doing 25 years ago when your voice was different 25 years ago, then it's probably just as useless as doing absolutely not all. That's a very valid point. So then what are we doing? Are we, I mean, I, I you know, you see voice actors talk about things like tongue twisters or there's breathing exercises that they yeah. do or, you know, humming scales or wh- what sort of things are we talking about that you could do in five minutes that we can, I mean, anything's better than nothing, I suppose, at this yeah, point, Yeah, of course. Right? Absolutely. So um, you'll get up off your chair. <laughs> you I already chill lost out, interest. Chill it out. <laughs> Put down the mashed potato. And there are five sort of basic steps that I recommend people go through, which is physical release of the body, then moving on to the breath. Then it's what we fancy terms call resonance, but basically vocal tone and getting the vibrations and the vocal fold of themselves going. Then it's the articulation and the shaping of the sound. And then it's coming on to the words you're, that you've got to say. So it's like a five step process. Now, they kind of dovetail into each other and you can make them merge as much as you need to. But a good example of how this should should work rather than a less efficient way is that if, if you start your warm up, you know, you wake up in the morning, you have your coffee and you go straight into tongue twisters, then you're probably not warming up in the most efficient way because tongue twisters are more useful and more uh, sort of effective when you've done a little bit of articulation release first, for example, in the step before. So physical body release, you could do a couple of spine rolls, you could have a wee cheeky stretch. If you're someone who does a bit of morning yoga, Mark, don't know if you're a yoga fan, a bit of a stretch in the morning, no? I value no? my body. <laughs> okay. If I were to do yoga, I I would have a whole other series of problems, which would involve trying to record from a hospital bed while they try right. to realign me. So. <laughs> well, that would not quite sound conversational enough, would it, if you were being <laughs> tweaked and pulled in all directions? So, yeah, maybe not. But look, point is, your yoga could be a lovely little bit of your first routine. Lots of people seem to do yoga these days, all the cool kids. Um, my wife does so, it, and and now my go. my baby does it. She my baby Great. all the time. She'll be crawling around the house, and then she'll just stop and go into downward dog. Down she's dog. Like, yeah, Why are she's, they so good? It's so unfair. Yeah, she's she's got it down, but, yeah. but uh, daddy doesn't have those skills. <laughs> so a bit of stretching, releasing tension. That's basically the aim for your warm up: releasing tension, making space, getting the airflow going. So you stretch out the muscles a bit, then you get the breath going with a few little exercises. A very popular one is the lip trill. <laughs> just kind of gliding up and down Mm -hmm. with some really kind of puffy, sassy horse lips. (laughs) Uh, You can also glide up and down on different different sorts of sounds uh, that fall into a category called semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, which is a fancy term for partially closed. Uh, Things like puffy Fs and puffy Vs, like all that kind of thing. Gets the vocal folds going in a really safe environment. Gets the breath going. And then you can do things to energize the breath as well, like swinging your arms around and kind of doing lots of huffs and puffs and things like that. And then you move on to the voice itself. So you do a little bit of uh, sort of playing around in the different resonance spaces. And this is different for everybody, remember. But um, we have sort of different cavities within the vocal tract that we can, um, I suppose, manipulate and harness to make different tones so if I wanted to go for my like really kind of um, husky, I don't never have to read like this, but that kind of, you know, really sexy thing, then I'm in more of a pharyngeal kind of throaty resonant place. I'm making my pharynx a bit bigger, lowering larynx, making some more space there. Whereas if I wanted to go something a little bit brighter for maybe like a club read that I never get asked to do, <laughs> um, then um, I'm using a bit more nasal resonance, maybe some oral resonance. So you can have a little play of balancing those spaces so that you've got lovely access to really lots of vocal variety, which is another thing that people come to a lot of the time. More corporate speakers, actually. You know, their boss has said, your voice is too monotone. Nobody wants to listen to you when you're doing the monthly sales figures. Please fix it, which is um, another information for another podcast. Yeah. Uh, Unwanted opinions on voices (laughs) (sighs) and the damage that does. Yeah, for sure. Nothing to Um, put you in therapy like that, eh? Oh, my God, yeah. Especially parents. They're the worst. They give us so many voice hang-ups. But listen, we'll do that next time. Um, So, yeah, play around with that resonant variety. Then you move into articulation. You release the articulators. So that's like the jaw, the tongue, the lips, the get the soft palate going, the pharynx itself. And then you work uh, moving on to the text. So there's lots of different things. Do you want to do an exercise? Should I give you one to play with? I, I (laughs) yeah, as I'm choking on my COVID. I I don't know. (laughs) What I'm really finding interesting about this, I guess, the, the biggest part of it is this idea and and i know this is definitely part of my problem is that when you're young you're invincible right 
Yes. So you don't think about yes. this stuff, right? But now I'm starting to get a little bit older. I'm not old, but I mean, I'm in my 40s, right? And and I notice that I don't, on a big e-learning job, right? I, I don't mm-hmm. last like I used to last. And so it's getting, I part of it is just changing the mindset of recognizing, hey, I need to think about my voice long term. I'm sure that's part of it. My guess is that if you do these things, you know, even five minutes every day, that it is going to have an impact on your performance as well. And so there's a mindset shift that has to happen there. When, you know, you're, when you're 20 years old, you can walk into the studio and you can just knock out a voiceover and it's no big deal. But if you want to still be able to do the same thing when you're 40 years old, I mean, you said it, right? It's, it's, it's a 70-year-old that wants to run the marathon. It's going to take a little bit longer to train. Well, if you start training when you're young, it becomes a lot easier in the long term, I guess, is, is a big part of it. And so now I do have to think about this stuff. So, mm. Well, what's interesting is the different demographics of clients that I have, really. I I have quite a lot of newcomers to the industry type clients who sort of recognize that the voice is a pretty crucial part of this mm-hmm. <laughs> as a job. Like, if your voice doesn't work, sorry, but you're not going to work. So yep. I have newcomers to the industry uh, quite eager to know a little bit about how the voice works, at least set up the basics of a warm up, plant the idea. And it's all about awareness and understanding what your voice needs. Then you get people who've been in the industry for ages who are like, well, I'm fine, you know, they smoke a fag and have a whiskey and do the read. And it I've always really done it this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, who are you? I don't know. I don't need this. This is nonsense. <laughs> blah, blah. Or I know how to warm up. But Dame Fanula Fajesa, 40 years ago when I was at the conservatoire, told me to do this and use <laughs> my diaphragm, darling. And that's all. I just use, I just use my diaphragm and I'm fine. It's like, Do not get me started on the diaphragm. (laughs) But the point is, there's always something you can do to explore. Make your life easier. That's my point. Like like I said earlier, warming up can reduce editing time, makes voicing more less effortful and more easy. Um, It can make you freer and more responsive. And also, it's actual mindset to be ready to do the job. Like... I know if I've been like faffing around with my family and I come in and I've got an early session and I don't take a few minutes just to settle myself, then I'm going to have to do the read like six times because my my mind is not in it. Whereas if I just take, say that would take half an hour, if I take five minutes to warm up, I can get that job done in 10 minutes and I've saved myself time. So it's also weirdly like an active meditation sort of thing for me in, in terms of getting myself focused. So the benefits are many fold, really. I'm all about providing actionable, practical advice to voice actors. And I do that through a lot of different places. It happens on my YouTube channel. It happens every week right here in this podcast. It happens in my Facebook group, the Vopreneur Facebook group. But it also happens through my coaching. If you're looking at taking things to a new level on the business and marketing side of voiceover, if you need help using social media, doing email marketing, trying to figure out where to find leads, trying to figure out how to grow your business in general, I offer a number of different resources for voice actors to help you grow your business. You can visit my website at markscottcoaching.com. Check out some of the different courses that I offer. I'm also available for private one-on-one coaching. I would love to have the opportunity to work with you in that setting, addressing your specific needs and working through some of your specific challenges. Hey, you can even book a free 15-minute consult with me to figure out if I'm even the right fit for you in the first place. All of the details on the different resources that I offer for marketing coaching is available at markscottcoaching.com. That's M-A-R-C-S-C-O-T-T coaching.com. Now back to our show. I think you could do an exercise. I'm curious. Uh, Just one, just a little one. All right. right, Oh my goodness. Here we go. All right. I'll try not to (laughs) cough my COVID all over the, all over the podcast. I'll just give you a little one to, what, (laughs) should a little one just to reduce, to uh, release the tongue root a little bit. All right. That sounds nice. Okay. You're like, I don't know what the tongue root is. Just do it. No, yeah. I don't know what any of this means. (laughs) Right. So um, all you're going to do. Oh, this is where I wish we had cameras because this is where I get to enjoy. This is where I'm so grateful that we don't have cameras. (laughs) (laughs) You can send me a screenshot, (laughs) a little picture of yourself, a selfie. Right. So let's stick the tongue out onto the lower lip. We'll do something to release the tongue root, which is really good for vocal freedom, really good for range and variety and really good for extra volume with minimal effort. So... Stick your tongue out on your lower lip. Okay. 
There we go. Absolutely nailed it. Well done. Yeah. And you're going to speak through days of the week, months of the year, and count one to ten. And then you're just going to let your tongue gently flop back into your mouth and just tell me how. Just tell me how it feels. Okay. I don't. I'm, I don't need some amazing. Oh my God! You've changed my life. Just like tell me what the experience was like. Okay. okay? So you want me to so, stick my tongue out and stick do... your tongue out, mm. and we're going to say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 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 Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday, January, February, January, February, March, March, April, April, May, June, June, July, July, August, August, September, September, October, October, November, November, December. December. And then finally... One, two, three. One, two, four, three, four, four five, five, six, six seven, seven, eight, eight nine, nine, ten. ten. Let your tongue slip back in. Just wipe away any saliva that you've been <laughs> dripping down the sides of your face. Oh, it's, so, it's such a bummer that there's no video of this. Gosh darn it. <laughs> Well, see, I get to enjoy this most days with many strangers on the internet. <laughs> I was going to say that must make for some really interesting sessions. It does. How does your tongue feel, Mark? It's a weird question, but tell me. Interesting. It's my my cheeks feel a little tight right now, probably because I was trying not to laugh while I was, do- <laughs> while I was doing it. So it's like, that's what I'm thinking about right now. But I don't know. I don't. I don't well, know. that's the interesting thing about warm-ups because so often our proprioception of how our voice actually feels is really out of whack because we've literally never thought about it. So first step with every single client I have is things like this where I say, let's do this and tell me how you think it feels. And they go, I don't know, like my tongue feels like it's been out in the air for a bit. <laughs> Maybe some people go, oh, it feels a bit floppy. Some people go, I'm not really sure. Um, And so much of warming up is understanding how your voice feels and being able to go, hmm, I feel a bit of tension in my tongue, actually. I'm going to do a tongue exercise. Or, hmm, my jaw feels a bit tight. Let's see if I can release that and see if it helps a bit. So it's completely natural and normal for you to be like, having never done anything voice training wise before, to be like, I don't really know. But I bet if you did this every day for a week, eventually you'd go, oh, that feels different. Or, oh, that was nice or weird or... That feels released or that feels whatever. Yep. Um, and slowly your proprioception and your kinesthetic feedback to yourself about what you're feeling uh, and all that sensory perception would really increase. And suddenly you'd think, oh, I want to get a hold of some more of these exercises because <laughs> they're really good. So I'm curious to know with, I mean, you've, you've given a number of different types of things that we can do to warm up. Are there different ones that you suggest for different scenarios? So where I may be sitting in the in the booth and just doing a long form narration like an e-learning or somebody might be doing an audiobook, that's a totally different animal from somebody who's doing character work or mm. video games or something like that with a lot of yelling or screaming or you know making weird noises or whatever. Mm. So are there different types of warm-ups that you would suggest? And also then I guess are there things we can do to be protecting ourselves when we're doing sessions like that? Yeah. Uh, Warm-up is absolutely context-dependent. So if you are someone who does a lot of gentle narration for audiobooks or corporate stuff, you're probably going to want to focus a little bit more on breath. So with a nice support of the breath, you can get through those really long, complex, conversational, like long sentences with all those big medical words or whatever it happens to be. And a little bit on clarity. So you're going to work more on re- releasing the articulators, that sort of thing. And also in a technique-based session for a voiceover, I would also be encouraging physical setup next to the mic. So I'd be making sure the alignment was as efficient as possible and that the breath could work within that person's environment in terms of whether they sit or stand and that kind of thing. Uh, on the flip side, if you're doing something that's more character-based or requires more vocal dexterity and flexibility and maybe manipulation, then you want to be really focusing on a lot of articulation release to get rid of any tension, ready for any inevitable tensions that may creep up when you're working outside of your habitual vocal range. And I would also say a really physical body warm up is really important just to make sure that your body's connected. Because if you're thinking about extremes for gaming, where a lot of it's efforts and battle cries and all that kind of stuff, so much of that comes down to 
making sure in terms of vocal health and looking after yourself comes down to making sure that you're anchoring in the body and you're really connecting with the strength that you can have in the body to support the voice and making sure the breath is free. So I would be making sure that the body's really working and that they're checking in with their support. So some slightly higher energy breathing drills to make sure that the breath support is connected nicely to the onset of the vocal folds. And I'd also be making sure that they're playing around with exploring working with less air because a lot of the time with when I work with people who are in gaming and they're blowing their voices and stuff, it's because they think you need loads more air to go louder and higher. And actually, you don't really in a gaming environment. It's actually safer vocally to work with less air. So I would be trying to encourage just reminding their body not to take quite as much air in, that sort of thing. So lots of different things you could be... um. Uh, working on and also with gaming and animation and long form narration it's not just a warm up we're talking about here you can also do what's called a vocal reset and a vocal cool down so you know if you stop every 45 minutes to get some more water or to stretch your legs or whatever your routine happens to be you can put in a two minute reset of a couple of little stretches a few little exercises just to reset the vocal folds and the sort of vocal mechanism so that it stops things building up this is so interesting because we don't think anything about going out and working with a voiceover coach, right? Everybody goes out and they'll drop their 150 or $200 or $300 or whatever it costs to go and work with the coach who's going to help you to interpret a script or, you know, deliver that game performance or learn how to do the best e-learning read or whatever. But I would venture to guess that the vast majority of voice actors, myself included, it's never even dawned on us to work with somebody like mm. you to teach us how to actually use our voice, right? That's the other side yeah. of the equation is how to actually use our voice so that we can do all of those things that the performance coaches are teaching us in these sessions. And so it's it's really interesting to learn that there's there's a, a lot to this. So we've done our warm-ups. We're doing things to try to protect ourselves when we're doing loud voices or yelling or screaming or making all these noises and all of that sort of stuff. But Something that I think that we all struggle with on a daily basis, which is a little bit more basic, things like plosives, sibilance, mouth noise, mm. things of that nature. Now, mm -hmm. we're often told that, you know, mic placement is a part of that or, you know, fix it in post, right? That's the universal solution to everything is fix <laughs> it in post. Are there things that we can do simply in how we speak that help reduce some of these things? Yeah, of course there are. Hmm. Well, where should I start with this? So you can absolutely explore altering the way you make sounds at an articulation contact level. So what's what's touching what basically to make the sound. You can always have a play around with what's going on there. I would always caution people in terms of trying, like making a huge decision that they're, they have to change their sibilance because one producer somewhere said they're sibilant, you know, because so much of that sibilance particularly is quite objective no subjective I always get those mixed up is subjective so different producers will hear sibilance at a different level and it will for some of them it will, it will be annoying and for some of them it won't so things like that I always say okay well who's told you how many times have they told you why do you want to change it we have a bit of a chat about it because it can take quite a long time to work through making a sound in a completely different way than you have been habitually your whole life and that is absolutely possible, but I'm always managing expectations that it can take quite a long time to build in that new habitual pattern and that new neural pathway so your body knows to make your S like this as a sit instead of like this, for example. So S has come up a lot and I do a lot of work on that. And some people, just the awareness of it is all they need. Yep. Um, some people, it's about airflow. So it's about trying to use less air so it may feel like an articulation thing to start with but actually what you find is people are just putting too much air through all the time and then s certain sounds happen more kind of energetically than they need to so it's just about readdressing the airflow and kind of balancing that up plosives are a really interesting one I am terrible with plosives <laughs> I have them all the time it's one that I um, struggle with too I think everybody does yeah. yeah and I think if possible do try and work on it with a mic thing and, you know, a mic thing, she says, well, who's great with the tech? Me. Definitely call me. <laughs> Fix it in post. It'll be Fix fine. Fix it with the mic thing. Do yeah. the mic. Um, what I would say with plosives is, again, it's about exploring how you make the sound and the other options. Because some people, 
they're like, I'm plosive and I don't know why. And you say, well, how do you make your pee? And they go, oh, I don't know. I just make it. Puh. Puh. Or whatever. Oh, God, sorry. <laughs> uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm red. Um, or whatever it is. And all you have to do is say, okay, do you know when you make a pee, it's with both lips? Bilabial. It's a bilabial plosive. So let's try bringing those lips together not quite as hard. So you don't need quite as much air to explode plosive, explode them open. So that's step one. So it's, if you just say to somebody, can you just do your pee a little bit less energetically? <laughs> that's all they need to know. They're like, oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. And it's a dead simple fix. Sometimes it's more extreme and you have to do this fun, fun little techniques to think about like thinking inwards instead of outwards. So imagining the pee is coming inwards <laughs> when you say it. So instead of saying like Percy's pickled pineapples, you might say Percy's pickled pineapples and think inwards. That works for people. There's lots of different fixes. What I always say with any of this stuff is it's about exploring. There is no one size fits all really. And I've worked with a lot of people now. You know, some people one exercise works, some people another exercise works. Some people you have to come up with some completely random image based thing to help them access the energy that you're trying to get them to access or the airflow that you're trying to get them to access or the articulation content that you want. Like it, it's just a constant like kind of change and oh, what works and what doesn't. That's what I love about it. It's kind of like, I don't know, like making potions. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what works for you might not work for them. Should we add a bit of this? Yeah. Should we sprinkle a bit of that? Yeah. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question. Yes, there are things you can do for plosives, for sibilance, all that kind of stuff. Do bear in mind it can take time. So think about whether you really need to. It happened this week. I've got one client who I've worked with loads. She's having a great time, new to the career, working loads. She's had two people in the last year and a half say she's got a lisp all of a sudden. And she's like, no one's told me I've got a lisp. I was like, dude, I don't even hear a lisp. Like, I don't think you've got a lisp. And now you're thinking she's about like, it. So then it's going to be now in, she's the, thinking about it. in the yeah. back of your head. And, yeah. yeah. And that's what I say. Like, if anyone out there listening is a producer or anything like that, just be careful about what you say to people um, because it can really affect them. And I, I'm here at the coal face with them going, <laughs> somebody says I've got a lisp and I'm never going to work again. And it's like, well, haven't you been working for like four years up to this point and nobody has said you have a lisp? So we're going to have a couple of sessions. He's like, I might lose this job on it because this particular person can hear this sound that's setting off their uh, misophonia, <laughs> like really upsetting them. So we're going to explore it and just see what it is. And that's what we're going to do. She's like, I know I don't need to change it, but I'd love to know what's going on so that she has the power in the future to have other options. It's funny, like, I mean, every once in a while I get a little sibilant. It's not a problem for me, and it mm. is something that can be very easily fixed for me in post. But I know other voice actors that it is a real challenge for. And same thing on the plosive side. I could absolutely hear the difference when you were going through those things, like from one version to the other. And so it, it's interesting to know that there are ways that you can fix it. So if it's, you know, one of those issues that just pops up every once in a while, is it worth exploring? I guess maybe not if you can fix it in post. But... If it's an ongoing problem that you could fix before you get into the booth, then you save yourself a ton of time long term in trying to fix it in post. And there are little things by the sounds of it that can be done that can mm -hmm. really make a difference on it, which is which is really cool. I always I, this comes from the classic like because I've taught a lot in drama schools and I'm always really conscious of trying to encourage people to use certain types of language when they're talking about things. Nothing needs fixing. You know, your voice is your voice and your voice is absolutely wonderful and fine. It may need adjusting or adapting because of the context in which you're communicating. Mm -hmm. It may, you may need other options to work with in different jobs. But, you know, there's no, there's no problem. It's just, it's a particular feature that in this context needs uh, adjusting or changing or, or, or exploring. And it, it might seem pernickety, but I, I think things like that are the sort of things that in, in the voiceover world, we often don't really, everything's so time sensitive. It's like, I'm not going to work with it. You need to fix that. You need to fix that. That's a problem for me, blah, blah, blah. And it gets quite kind of, I don't know, just a little bit combative. And yep. I, I, I just, I'm conscious of using words like fix and, and problem and, and all that kind of thing. Just, I just wanted to give you my two penneth. <laughs> no, that makes total sense. I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? Like, I know that wonton soup and hamburger helper with box mashed potatoes doesn't actually help me get over my cold, but it makes me feel like I do. It's a psychological thing, right? Yeah. It's very much the same with some of this stuff. If you have an issue with sibilance and, you know, enough producers say it, 
it's probably only going to get worse because the more that you think about it, the more that it amplifies and, and all that. So there there becomes a, a psychological component to it. So mm. it totally makes sense that the language that we use around it makes a big difference too. So next to sibilance, plosives, things of that nature, the other big challenge is the filler words. The ums <laughs> and the ums. Well, you know we're going to say them loads now. Yes, you said because them. now we're going to be thinking about them. But it, but um. it does become like... Like, you know, like, if you like, oh my gosh, right? That one drives me insane. And I know that it's unconscious for, for most of us. I noticed it more when I started doing interviews for the podcast. And, and you sit down and you start editing. And, you know, I'm trying to edit all these things out so the conversations flow better. You can't edit when you're in real-time conversations, when you're, you know, in a session with six people on the line on Source Connect or whatever. Is it a habit that we can become aware of and that we can break? Why Why are we throwing in all the ums and the ahs and the filler words? Um, <laughs> I, could, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even going to do that deliberately. I like to make a joke. It just came out. Well, I, here's my thing when it comes to filler words. Now, I think we have to be, again, conscious of the context of those filler words because a lot of the time it's linked to dialect, Right. So I'm Northern Irish and I don't know if you know, but the Irish always put like words in that like we really don't need. But like there's just always extra words like in a sentence. <laughs> That's just how we talk. Now, it doesn't diminish my ability to do my job or anything like that. Does it roll over into sessions? I don't think so, because I have a very like under I have a decent understanding of like professional versus conversational environments. Right. Now, not everybody might have that experience on the mic. So when, you, when you're used to speaking on the mic as a voiceover, you don't have them because you're reading a script. Then when you get interviewed as a podcast, you suddenly start thinking, oh God, oh God, they're all going to come out because I've got to think of a really sensible, good answer and I need to sound dead intelligent and stuff. And we start to sort of censor ourselves and we start to kind of stop ourselves. And then our brain like gets almost on like stuck like a record and then we feel like we need to fill the silence so like we just put um like any sort of sort of like sound in yep. to fill it so that well can I be honest here as a woman it's something that women have done historically and there are studies on this because we get interrupted by men that's just the way it's been okay. so for women it has been something that many women feel like they have to put in so that they're not interrupted when they're taking a moment to think of that thought so that's just the social social impact for women anyway. That's what that's that phenomenon. And there's loads in that. And I won't go into it because I'm not saying you do that. You know, that's just historically mm -hmm. what it is from a female perspective. That's why we um a lot of the time. That's why we say like. It's why we end our phrases up at the end sometimes because we're made to feel like maybe our opinions aren't quite valid, that kind of thing. So there are things you can do. Um, well, <laughs> I can't stop doing them now. <laughs> you, I don't think it. you said um once through the entire podcast right, know, right up until we got to you. this point because now we're, now we're, you know, it's in our brain. We're thinking about <laughs> it, which is funny because that just explains how yeah. it works. Yeah, but. <laughs> so first thing you can do is remember that silence is okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that is a reframing. You know, it is absolutely fine to take a minute to think of your thought. Now, if the silence freaks you out, remember there are things you can put into that silence that you need to put in there in order to get your next thought out. One of those is breath. The reason we have breath is because we're fueling the thought that we're going to say. Breath is inspiration, literally, and that's beautiful because it's also the inspiration to speak. So the thought happens on the in-breath, right? Okay. So it happens subconsciously when we speak conversation we don't think about it but when you're working with actors and things you're always they're, they're they're processing the thoughts and the thought happens on the in breath and then they communicate that thought on the out breath so what you can do in those pauses to try and stop yourself going um and like and er is let a breath out let a breath in and then just speak again so it's not that you're just pausing you're not pausing and holding your breath and like waiting for the thought to come because that's terrifying yeah. <laughs> i would say you have to just let the breath out and let a breath in, ready for your next thought. So that's one thing you can do. Listening to yourself back is really useful if you're completely unaware. I mean, it's excruciating because <laughs> you suddenly go, oh, God, I say um every third word. People might find that annoying and they might tell me they find that annoying, which is not their right to tell them to get in the sea, but they probably will. Um, yeah, man. Um. <laughs> I literally can't stop now. The other thing 
you can do is it depends on the situation for speaking because if you ha- if you can prepare an answer and you can practice what you're saying then make sure you're up to scratch and you've done all your rehearsals yeah. <laughs> and you know what you're going to say if you're in a podcast interview I would just say take your time slow down allow the out breath let the breath back in again but also I did an episode of my podcast the voice coach podcast on this and I I don't have a problem with filler words really because they're part of conversational speech and we listen to conversational speech all the time. And I sometimes feel pe- people get hung up on podcasts feeling like they have to be perfect. <laughs> like, we're all used to hearing likes and ums and ahs and stuff. And if it's just a conversation between two people and they happen, it doesn't really bother me because I hear it all the time, you know? So I think we also have to give credit to the listener and also give credit to the listener outside of our own kind of auditory hang-ups <laughs> uh, and our own beliefs of of what they may or may not mean because everything about sound and what we hear comes down to some kind of unconscious bias of what we feel that sound may represent. Most people think like represents someone being ditzy and stupid and not knowing anything. They don't think like might be linked to the fact that they're Irish and it just like kind of happens because it's like sort of the kind of dialect like now. So it's a cultural (laughs) thing. Yeah, it's a cultural thing. Same with the, you know, the which coast, the east, west, west coast of America, you know. There are a lot of likes there. Yep. <laughs> and that is part of the dialect, whether you like it or not, you know. So I think th- it is a big conversation. If you just want to get rid of them, practice using the pause to let the out breath go. Let the in breath come in with that inspired thought, ready to say it. But also as listeners, we have a responsibility to really address our own views on these sorts of things because we all have them, you know. It's just unconscious bias. It's what it is. It's what the media tells us to believe. The pause is is a big part of it. I know for me, my problem is just that my mouth works faster than my brain sometimes. And so I just need to take a... I need to take that breath so I can have a second to let my thoughts collect up with, you know, or catch up with what I'm about to say. And when I do that, I notice that I don't say it as much. I don't have as many of those little filler words because I've given myself a minute, figure out what I'm going to say and spit it out. And so that's certainly a big part of it. Well, Nick, this has been awesome. I've learned a lot. And I think a lot of people have learned a lot from this. And I'm hoping that there are some people that are going to get in touch with you because look, the voice is the money maker, right? It's if you don't take care of that, you can have your U87 and your studio bricks (laughs) and your Apollo twin and whatever else you've got in your booth. But if you don't take care of your voice, none of that stuff counts for crap. So this has been really amazing. If somebody wants to get in touch with you, I know you do a podcast. So Mm -hmm. tell us about the podcast and and how we can reach out if uh, somebody wants to get in touch with you, maybe do a little bit of coaching. Yeah. So my podcast is called The Voice Coach Podcast, and that's 10 minutes a week of the basically the voice training process dead easy i also have another one called the voice over social which is more related to voiceover and all the things that happen there um i i have a course that's on sale right now <laughs> if if i can mention that yeah go ahead great it's called the uh, vocal empowerment program and it's basically teaching everybody everything they need in order to be able to prep, look after, maintain their voice. And basically, it's basically the Be Your Own Voice Coach course. I mean, I don't know what I'm thinking, but <laughs> I'm putting it out there into the world. You can buy that at the moment. And if you just go to my website, it's there under courses. Okay. What the website? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, NickRedmanVoice.com. NickRedmanVoice.com. Okay. And the podcast is on a, on the same website, wherever fine yeah, podcasts it's, are given it's, away for free. Same as mine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's everywhere. Right and on. my website. Okay. And what about social media? If somebody wants to find you on social media, are you active on any of the platforms? Insta's. Yeah. Insta's probably the one. Okay. Uh, at Nick Red Voice, okay. N-I-C-R-E-D Voice. And then you can also join my voice. I have an entire Facebook community. There's like four and a half thousand people in there now. Um, and it's called The Voice and Accent Hub. And it's all about voice and accent training for all spoken voice users. That might be another interview for another time if we dive into uh, accents, because yeah. that's uh, <gasps> another very popular subject. And I get accused all the time of being Canadian, except that I've never said oot in a boot in my entire life. But (laughs) as soon as people hear you're from Canada, they just automatically assume that that's what you sound like. So that could be a whole other episode. We, We could dive into accents. I'd love to. All right, Nick. Well, thank you so much. This has been very enlightening. I, now I've got some vocal exercises that I'm, that I'm going to have to do. 
If do I don't that. see you doing that on Instagram, Mark, I'll be really upset. I, the slug tongue. Get that tongue out. <laughs> I didn't even have my phone in the booth when we're recording this interview, so I couldn't even take a, a selfie of it. So I feel like now I'm going to have to go back and, and recreate it, it just so that people yeah. know. But it, it did happen, and it, and it was real. And, <laughs> and uh, there you go. So now you've got exercises to work on. Well, Nick, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the wisdom that you've shared. And I know that this is going to make a big difference for people. We've got to protect the moneymaker. Thank you very much for having me. We all make a point of creating a budget for ourselves every year that we're going to spend this money on training or we're going to spend this money on a new coaching program or we're going to invest money working with a new coach, buying some new equipment, attending a conference, getting a new demo, whatever it is. There's so many different areas where we invest money into our business, but I'm guessing the vast majority of us have never thought about investing a little bit of money into our money maker. And so I hope this episode encourages you to think about that as well, because Nick has so many good tips to offer, so many things that we're probably not thinking about nearly enough. I know I'm not, and so it is something that I need to be more cognizant about, because I do want my voice to be there for me in the long term. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm going to do, because all I know how to do is voiceover, so So thank you to Nick. Check out our website. Check out our course. And if you enjoyed this episode, could you do me a favor? Could you post that you are listening on Instagram and then tag both of us? You can tag Nick. It's at Nick Red Voice. You can tag me at Mark Scott. We'd love to know that you are listening. It's at Nick Red Voice and at Mark Scott. And I'll include those in the show notes as well. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Hope you learned a ton from it. Hope you are now thinking about how you can take care of your moneymaker. Thanks so much for listening. And I'll catch you on the next one. The Everyday Vopreneur Podcast. Available everywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Mostly, we think. Having your voiceover demos easily playable and downloadable on your website is essential. The Voice Sam Player lets you do that across any device and browser. There are also options for adding play buttons in your email signature, tracking your listens, and even putting videos in your demo player. Sign up now at voicesam.com slash markscott and receive an instant $25 credit. For full details and to claim this offer, visit voicesam.com slash markscott. And scene. And that's a wrap. Thanks for hanging in. Thanks for hanging out. Want more Vopreneur goodness? Jump online at vopreneur.com.